What's up guys, it's Dolomiter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Retrospective Review Warhammer 40k Dawn of War 2 by Thundersiker. So, I think this is the first Thundersiker video I've reacted to. Oh, oh, excuse me. Although I do have a list of Thundersiker videos that I've been asked to react to. And I decided to go with this one first because we've actually reacted to a couple of the Dawn of War things lately. We've reacted to the trailers for all the different games and the expansion packs. And being a big fan of RTS games, this is probably going to be one of the first ones I'm going to play. Uh, I've been looking at the Space Marine games, the Dawn of War games, and Darktide, which is the kind of like horde shooter game. And those being three genres I'm a big fan of, I'll probably jump into them first. Um, but yeah, like right off the bat, this game looks very much like StarCraft. Uh, just the layout right here, obviously very much StarCraft influenced. This game came out in 2009, so yes, Warhammer is an older franchise than uh, StarCraft is, but the this specific RTS, you can tell, is very StarCraft influenced, which makes sense because StarCraft was a very genre-defining game within the RTS genre. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for this because I'm a, a big fan of RTS games, and this looks really good from what I can see here. Obviously, this is just the first frame of the video, but it looks... Kind of like a StarCraft clone, so if it plays anything like StarCraft, I'll be a big fan of it. So, anyway, let's uh, jump into this link to the original video down below, and let's go. Storm Dawn of War was an impressive lineup of releases that went on to be revered as the High Lords of 40k games. The Master Incipient Original, the Diligent Winter Assault, the Beneficent Dark Crusade, and the other one. <laughs> burnt the fucking palace down. Over four years, Relic developed ideas on what to do with Dawn of War's gameplay mechanics and carve out their niche in the RTS market alongside their other success, Company of Heroes. But what they wanted to do would reinvent the core mechanics of the game in a way that would move away from common elements of real-time strategy, which was about as risky as setting a plasma gun onto rapid fire. My own interest in Warhammer had burnt out when this game came out, and while I bought Dawn of War 2 Retribution two years later, I've not actually played the base version of this game until now. I've been wanting to save it until I made a video like this, and I think it's long overdue to finally give it a visit and see what I was missing in 2009. I just noticed how tiny this little bolter is. It looks like an Asati's patent pepper grinder, and these guys are contestants for Warp's Kitchen. You're the fan, you fucking bitch! Cleanse the monstrosity! Cleanse the monstrosity! Looking at the case, remember games for Windows Live? My brother gave me his copy years ago because he didn't enjoy the game, but this bloody DRM locked me out of it. So this box spent Oof. the rest of its life on- Man, D DRM was like the worst thing ever. I remember back in the day you could literally let people borrow games, and then they started adding DRM to it, and you, ne and you needed to sign up, and then you couldn't- uh, And then everything eventually became digital because it was just- There was no point in not having digital games at that point. On a bookcase, ever vigilant for the scourge of Xenos that may assail its shelves. Heretic. Thankfully, this restriction <laughs> was removed a few years ago, so we can leave this controversial system to rest. Alongside the more beloved. THQ, my only regret is that I didn't make enough view draws. Man, rest in peace, THQ. They they made the second series of UFC games, too. UFC, I can't remember who the original one was, but they had like a UFC game way back in like the... I want to say like the mid to late 90s, like when UFC was still like tournaments and stuff. Uh, and then THQ took over the games after Zufa took over, and they made the, the UFC 1, UFC 2, UFC 3 before EA eventually took over after THQ went under. But yeah, THQ made a lot of good games. Rest in peace. Wait, never mind, they're back. <laughs> yes, again, oh, World I didn't even know that. Itself off on some of the best possible footing by when is this from? Two years ago? I had no idea THQ was back. Treating the player to an awe-inspiring intro cinematic. A small force of blood ravens are welcomed to the jungle by the elder. Oh yeah, watch but this. the fun and games were cancelled due to a forecast of Cloudy with a heavy chance of DEATH. It hits a lot of the same notes as before, like a dreadnought turning the tide and a heavy bolted guy getting fucking murdered. And the same way that valiant charge up the hill to plant that flag was indicative of the first game, the shift to a tightly focused skirmish that's more tactically sound than this is major foreshadowing for what's to come. <laughs> Dawn of War 2's story is tied directly to the plot of the first games, where we learn that the Space Marine ending to Dark Crusade is canon, and their ending in Soulstorm isn't. The Carava campaign had effectively crippled the Blood Ravens chapter, reduced to half their former strength, so the chapter returned to its recruiting worlds to rebuild their numbers. Carava was a mistake. Unfortunately for the Blood Ravens, one of its recruiting colonies in Subsector Aurelia finds itself in need of another mean green spring clean, so the chapter appoints a newly promoted commander, named by the player, to do the dirty work. Hmm, now what does this guy look like? 
Mm. Perfect. It isn't long before it's... I don't, <laughs> I don't even know. What is that reference from? I've never seen whatever movie or TV show that is. However, as the ancient Eldar are revealed to have been stirring up the orcs in Aurelia in hopes that they could be used to combat a greater threat of the subsector. And nope, they didn't do that this time. It's the Tyranids, a hive mind of all-consuming beasts that plans to strip Aurelia bare of life before moving on to feed on the rest of the galaxy. Despite their losses, the Blood Ravens managed to keep cool under pressure and set off to devise a solution to stop the Hive Fleet for good while dealing with the opportunistic Orcs and Eldar. You know, I never got why humanity and the Eldar never just stop, collaborate, and listen. I sit back with my. Ah, oh, I know who that is. It's fucking Vanilla Ice, bro. It was pretty clear that Dawn of War 2 was going to be a different game to the first, but after two intro cutscenes, for some reason, it finally becomes apparent just how jarring a change they'll be, as Vanilla Rice turns up with his army of five guys. Vanilla Ice. Wait, really? Where is everybody? Can I reinforce? Is that all that was left? Can I get a servitor? Is there something I can What the fuck build? is retreating? Why is there a captain with a heavy bolt? What do you mean there's no base? Can I upgrade my really? weapon? Where is anyone? How the terrain? How the fuck, fuck up? What is going on? How many go died on Kaurava? While Dark Crusade's campaign twist was a big strategy layer that linked skirmishes to a larger conflict, Dawn of War 2 takes the opposite approach, choosing to show the Space Marines as the one-men armies the lore describes them as. Yet a lot of the game's mechanics are very un-Space Marine-y things, such as taking cover, taking new weapons from enemies, and running away. <gasps> to sound less like a strategy guide to Halo on Legendary, cover is yeah. a lot more important than the last game, with explosives, vehicles, or a very eager force commander able to smash through a unit's protection and change the battlefield as the skirmish goes on. In the campaign, you unlock new war gear for an RPG-style loot system, with weapons offering unique stats and abilities to their defaults, while weapon upgrades in skirmish mode work the same way as the first game, but also include the kind of buffs usually done as research in a standard RTS. The morale system has been gutted entirely, and most weapons that used to affect it now either suppress enemies, pinning them down, or make a complete mockery of cover. So you're now able to make units fall back to save the precious upgrades you've spent on them. The most notorious change, however, was the complete removal of base building. Combined with the drop in scale, led to a very alienated player base and a lot of sad servitors. Yeah, that seems so weird. Like, it's an RTS game. Why would you have no base building? It's like such a core mechanic of the RTS genre. Maybe, maybe it'll end up being good. I don't know. There's been a lot of debate over whether this was the right thing to do, for the crunch or the fluff, and personally, I think I prefer base building and lots of units over micromanaging small-scale battles. Heck, I think Soulstorm's Flyers are the right track for a sequel. A proper air game over those battles would have been cool to see. But I also love the dynamic of the cover system, and I actually like the reduced research over having my Eldar build generators and rediscover how to go fast. I wish Relic <laughs> didn't have to sacrifice the scale back then to accommodate the new changes, yet weirdly, despite Skirmish being closer to the first game, I think I enjoy the hard- that is, that is true, I just rediscover how to go fast. It's one thing that always annoyed me about like campaign mode in a lot of RTS games. Sure, it kind of makes sense like when you're playing PvP, sure. But when you're doing campaign mode and it's like, oh yeah, we're in a, we're in a new area, now we have to rediscover the same thing we just discovered. It's like, we already know this. Half of Dawn of War 2, ignore that one for now, that's the least like the original game. Unlike the first game, where the campaign was a mission-based skirmish and skirmish was a missionless campaign, every mode in Dawn of War 2 is its own take on the base gameplay. A real-time tactics game, a horde mode, and whatever the fuck the campaign is. Vanilla Ice's mm. posse is a lot smaller than Gabriel's, as you're now controlling four squads of specialist units, each led by distinctive characters. Tarkus, Cyrus, Thaddeus, and the asshole. Thaddeus is an assault marine that crashes into melee combat. Avatus provides raw firepower with heavy weaponry. Cyrus's stealth and unique arsenal makes it possible to clear levels entirely with just him. And Tarkus plays just as much like the battle-hardened mentor that he acts as. And once he gets infinite grenades, he becomes a god of war. You also see these characters <laughs> interacting with one another between some missions, and a lot of their dialogue is genuinely great at fleshing out their personas, the background lore of Aurelia and 40k, and building up to enemies you encounter. Much of it rivals, and sometimes surpasses, the story of Dawn of War 1, and I quite like how they represent the different phases of a Space Marine's life and their attitudes to war and humanity. It's probably a good thing a lot of this is on the planet map too, as a lot of the in-game cutscenes drop back to Dawn of War 1 levels. Save your excuses, witch. Angel Forge is secure. Your life is at its end. Riveting! Speaking of which, <laughs> this. Yeah, the scenes are kind of rough. I mean, this game's from, what, 2009? So, yeah, you're talking about 
SC2. Did StarCraft 2 have its expansion out yet, or was just StarCraft 2 out? When did StarCraft 2 come out? 2010. So, yeah, this is right before StarCraft 2, which obviously had much better graphics, but I feel like well, the big problem with, like, a lot of these games that are in these, like, you know, like, Warhammer universe and other universes related to this is they pump them out so quickly. Like, when I was looking at the, the list of Warhammer video games, it started off with, like, one a year, one every couple of years, and then by the time you get to, like, the mid-2000s, there's, like, five games a year, which is, like, kind of good, kind of bad, right? Obviously, there's endless content if you're a huge fan of the series, but... This is also a quality over or quantity over quality issue where a lot of them just aren't going to be good because they're being pumped out so quickly. This is how Soulstorm's planet map should have been. A lot of the missions are shorter than a standard mission in Dawn of War 1, so you'll often revisit maps you've been on before to defend a facility or square off against an enemy commander, which gives your units a chance to grow and get more war gear alongside main missions. Nobody in a Blood Raven seems to have issues with losing relics from aliens, or in some cases other chapters, while the Imperium would probably consider them tainted by Xeno cooties, but I like that each item has a bit of backstory linked to the previous games, or other parts of Warhammer 40,000's lore. It's almost as though it's like- NO! DON'T! I know they came out around the same time, but comparing anything to this is- no! <laughs> Don't! I want to note that I'm not a big fan of loot fest games or anything that requires you to grind. grind! But I rarely felt Dawn of War 2's system fell into their pitfalls. Usually you find enough weapons that you're hardly ever under-equipped, and while many utility items are fairly niche, others are so powerful that not using them would make the Emperor weep. Gaining abilities from leveling up and improving stats ends up being a satisfying progression process, much like Dark Crusade's own war gear and honor guard. You can even go over approaches like Melee Tarkas and Ranged Thaddeus, which are surprisingly viable outside of higher difficulties. Just don't make Melee Avatus, unless you really don't like his anti-Garsman policy. Heck, if you're on the hardest difficulty, there's some weird builds that work surprisingly well, like giving your Force Commander heavy weapons, which seems to be common in the Blood Ravens. Then there's the Tyranid Invasion, where the Tyran has become more dangerous over the course of in-game days. You only get a certain number of deployments each day, which is where those facilities come in handy, and missions with a high infestation level will leave you praying for the Emperor's protection. The Tyranids are easily the strongest aspect of Dawn of War 2's campaign to me, as they reveal the swarms of them on missions, and seeing their tendrils reach out from space to engulf planets creates a sense of dread that stands up to chaos in the Necrons in Dawn of War 1. It overshadows the other races though, the Orcs end up being forgettable, and the Eldar's reveal is hardly as menacing or mysterious as the first games. Just down the open. mission structure gets really good use out of the game's pseudo-RPG mechanics. It's got that XCOM loop where you're always working towards something in missions with your units level up being more of a side effect rather than grinding. And you can always dump, <coughs> donate lower level war gear to the librarian. I do think the campaign does have quite a few weak points though. Going through the same maps can become tiresome by the end run, and while the boss fights are conceptually really cool, they are aggravating damage sponges at the worst of times. Random loot and choosing your missions opens up replay. I feel like that's the problem with like a lot of games that you have. A, uh, so many games have this where instead of having like some difficult mechanic that you need to learn, and then once you learn it, you'll get through the boss. A lot of games literally it's just like just stand here and just hit this over and over again until your fucking mind is numb and then it'll die. And, and that can be such a big issue with a lot of games because it's, you know. Just having a massive health pool does not make a good boss, right? Doesn't make a strong boss, doesn't make a good boss, right? I feel like the best bosses, there is some kind of, like, challenge to it in terms of skill and not necessarily just, you know, in terms of being willing to sit there for an hour grinding your face against this fucking giant health bar. ...value, but the start is always the same and is so damn long that getting there means killing a few hours each playthrough. It's not until the mid-game that it really picked up for me, where you get access to all three planets, and all the UI stuff you're teased with starts to come into play. I also wasn't getting many of the intro cutscenes when I played. I don't know if it was an issue with the Steam version or something, but I missed out on some of the best parts of the story. Let's just say thank God for Big Dick Cheney. <laughs> that sounds really weird out of context. Despite all this, I think Dawn of War 2's campaign is still definitely worth a try. You can even play it with online co-op, which I would absolutely recommend. The game flows even better when you and a friend are controlling two units each. But I can also see- Hey, that's Alpha Busa. I watched his videos too. These guys must be like- A lot of these guys must talk to each other in like Discord or something, like all these guys that make these Warhammer videos. Which I guess kind of makes sense. Wouldn't find this appealing, because this mode is less of an RTS and more of an SRPG. Oh boy, why are we getting Gabriel Angelos in Smash Brothers? I'd rather have him in the game than... FUCKING CORIN!
<laughs> Skirmish is the closest mode to the original game by far, but it's also where the game's overhauls are at their most apparent. For starters, you pick a commander unit amongst three for your race before you start a match, which will have different combat focuses and traits to support you or your allies' armies. This adds some extra variety to skirmish matches, but also opens up strategy for team-based multiplayer, with each commander's battlefield role like offense, support, and teleport. What kind of role is teleport? You know, all successful team-based games share the same class archetypes like the tank, the DPS, and the teleport! <laughs> Fuck! The existing races Hello, still play a lot like before, <laughs> though new tactics mean Eldar do have to rely on their mobility rather than being a blob of murder-boning Wraithbone, while the Tyranids are kind of like orcs if they were weaker, but just flat out had more of them. I can see how they try to use this game to show how numerous Tyranid swarms are, even if I think it doesn't quite hit the mark, but they do still make an interesting enemy to face with units like the Lictor, or the Ravener, which can go under instead of over. Oh, is that from Tremors? Yeah. <laughs> Every gun is preloaded in that fucking video. <laughs> That's some classic Hollywood shit. <laughs> Always have your guns preloaded, just in case. Unique like the Necrons were, but I still find it fun to chew up some orcs with a bunch of Carnifexes. A lot of elements of Dawn of War 2 skirmish feel like natural evolutions of its predecessor, mostly in the vein of aggression. Strategic points completely dictate your resources now, you have to fight your opponents to gain access to your race's powers, and the way you can mix up the war gear on your heroes alongside their specialties makes it apparent why this game got its own following. But for me, there were some glaring problems which really killed my enjoyment of Skirmish. First of which is the AI, which tends to prioritize capturing resource points over combat, that makes for these weird moments where units will run past your charges to capture a requisition point. In the grander scheme, it means you're starved of resources and line of sight, and with listening posts going the way of the morale system and turrets only being for certain commanders, your points are completely undefended if you're not guarding them at all times, or if you're chasing AI units around the map. In the grim darkness of the far future, we might as well hear nothing but fucking yakety sacks! Ah! <laughs> this is definitely the kind of game you want to play with friends, or if you're- Enemy a team, fuck the plebs. ...find someone <laughs> online, because the AI's attrition tactics are just annoying. The other problem I think Skirmish Mode has is just a lack of content. Jumping from 9 races to 4 is naturally going to have this effect, which I'm fine with being a whole new game, but there's even less maps than Vanilla Dawn of War, the player counts dropped from 8 to 6, and there's even fewer victory conditions. Man, that was a problem they had in Halo Infinite as well. I think in Halo Infinite, I'm, I'm pretty sure they've released more maps since then because they've had two major DLC updates, but at the start of Halo Infinite, I think if you played like the main game modes, one, they nuked the amount of game modes you had, right? There was no team deathmatch, which is what everyone wants to play, right? Um, so that was a big factor. And then two, they had, like, I think six to eight maps, whereas the original Halos had, like, much more than that. You're talking about games that are, like, 20 years old. I don't understand why companies do that. Well, I, I do. They do it so they can sell it to you in DLC, but they're shooting themselves in the foot because it's like okay well now less people are playing your game so less people are going to buy the dlc whereas if you had a good game to start with people would buy the dlc you're limited to up to 3v3 annihilate up to 3v3 capture point 2v2v2 2v2 capture point and free for all capture point kind of weird to not have free for all annihilate considering it used to be the go-to mode though i reckon it's because the game wasn't built around those sorts of battles annihilate can be a slog sometimes when even friends of mine who love this game were quickly getting tired of it and victory points default for the game's online matchmaking which maybe goes to show why Dawn of War 2 was so disappointing for some. Its appeal is completely different to the first games, which as a sequel, I'm not so sure was a good idea. Now, there's another mode in Dawn of War 2 called The Last Stand, a survival mode where three players control a single hero unit each and face off against waves of enemies. But I want to look at that mode once I cover Chaos Rising, partly because Last Stand has a fun end twist tied to it, but also because this video is way too long already, oh my god. <laughs> To me, the first game's visuals look like the style of a tabletop game with its own flavour added to its atmospheric elements, while Dawn of War 2 is more reminiscent of 40k's artwork. Maybe it's the new cutscenes that make me think that. They do a great job of setting the game's tone and building up encounters with some bosses, except maybe the Lictors, the way he just runs up some guy cracks me up. Maybe that's why he's ambush and not stealth. 
God, these texts are so stupid. The environment <laughs> design is stellar. The planets of Aurelia are even based on world classifications from the lore. And seeing terrain mutate in the campaign as the Tyranids overtake them is a very nice touch. Admittedly, nah, the three cool. environment types end up getting pretty samey, but maps with unique set pieces like Angel Gate tend to pay off as being suitably grand. Apart from Argus Gate, this is supposed to be the entrance to a planetary capital. The walls barely look taller than the one around my hometown. Speaking of which, if you're- <laughs> Yeah, it looks like some fucking Middle Eastern city from like the fucking, you know, 4000 BC. Like, you know, it's the fucking capital of the fucking Akkadian Empire. If you ever want to take a holiday to the middle of fucking nowhere, come on down to Norwich. We've got enough churches to make the Polish blush, and a pub crawl will probably kill you. Because half of them have been shut down. If you break in, you don't know what's in there. Hmm. <laughs> probably my grandma. There's some other advancements from the first game, too. Units duck and motion in ranged combat rather than standing still as bullets chew them to pieces. Sync kills return as brutal as ever, and some bodies even have ragdoll physics or explode into bloody giblet. 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 gilbert. Units explode into Gilbert Godfrey. Sadly, this means persistent bodies are no longer a thing, which would have been amazing next to destructible terrain. This game needed one thing Abatus and I both agree on. Say the line, Abatus. More corpses. Yeah! <laughs> The music of Dawn of War 1 had some wonderful calm and atmospheric tracks which gave some really great undertones to the game's single player, and the expansions went on to provide intense, exciting, and thrilling battle tracks for the multiplayer. But even without Jeremy Saul or Einan Zer, Dawn of War 2's music is still a resounding success in capturing the sound of the universe. Everything about Doyle Donahue's work in this game screams honor, glory, carnage, and defiance in the face of terror. The banging of drums, rows of strings, and blaring brass with accompanying choirs are played consistently through battles to create something that sounds truly thunderous. This is a soundtrack worthy of a space marine. The orc theme is full of primal drums, grunts, and chants. The Tyranids feels like the musical equivalent of alien vines slowly creeping and devouring, and the Eldar's theme's an interesting contrast to the first game, where instead of mystical yet menacing sounds, it's dominated by graceful choirs and gives the impression of an ancient race going to war. But I'm not done yet! Relic had a Billy Mays here. great care and attention to its sound design, and Dawn of War 2 couldn't be a greater example of this. The bolter sounds suitably punchy this time. Shooters roar and bolts of lightning zap, crackle, and pop, and every sound is a lovingly crafted interpretation of Warhammer's weaponry and worlds. Completing this triumvirate is the voice acting, which carries a lot of the personality of your squad mates, and with old and new talent, I think lives up to Dawn of War 1's impressive lineup. Space Marines still roar with righteous vigor. Your duty is not done, brother! Orcs still come out with scurrilous quips. Wait! Where are you going to be? And the Eldar are still distinctly grand and enigmatic. When I will it, your very substance twists. It might sound kind of shallow, but I think that without the sound and visuals this game has, I would not have enjoyed it as much as I did during its duller moments. It reminded me of why I like Winter Assault despite its problems. It all feels good. And how the game feels is important to something adapting a universe like this one. Conclusion, shall we play it? I found it really hard to judge Dawn of War 2. It's so radically different to the first, not just in features, but even genre, that there's no wonder why it ended up so divisive. I wonder how much they were trying to make this game appeal to the last game's fans, because there's a lot of underlying similarities, but so many differences that this game has a completely different appeal to the first. I'm always going to prefer Dawn of War 1. It's the first one I played, and to me it struck a fine balance in adapting the lore and the tone of the tabletop, using an art- I feel like that's a thing with like a lot of gamers in a lot of games. Like most people- you can tell most people's first game they played in a genre by which one's their favorite. And I feel like a lot of that has to do with, you know, nostalgia and rose tinted glasses, but- more so for the time period, right? Because people, they, they they want to be younger, right? And and they have, like, fond memories of being younger, and then they get older, and they have more responsibilities, and a lot of the times they associate with that with the games. Um, so you'll, you'll see this a lot of, like, you know, World of Warcraft's a great example. Most people's favorite expansion in WoW is whichever one their first one was, or usually the first one that they hit level cap in. Um, that's why so many people like Wrath of the Lich King because it was the you know the most played expansion. So because honestly, if you go back, like I, I was recently working on my lore master achievement, so I was going back and doing a lot of the old quests, and a lot of them didn't age that well. Like they they they're really cumbersome and you know time consuming, and 
it's like the same as modern quests in some ways, but like you know, instead of going and collecting like five of this thing, it's like go and collect twenty of these things, and they're also only going to spawn off like half the enemies. Um, oh, part of it was the you know the Warcraft three uh, ending with the, the end of the Lich King. Um, you see this with Pokemon too. A lot of people, whatever their favorite Pokemon game is, is the first one they played. Um, you know, Halo. A lot of people's favorite Halo is the first one they played, right? This is why a lot of people love Halo 2, even though it's really rough. Like, I, I have Master Chief Collection. I play it all the time. And if you play online Halo Halo 1 or 2, they are fucking rough. Like, Halo 3 is aged incredibly well. The only thing that they don't that they have that's, uh, that they don't have that's really kind of missing is sprinting, right? And obviously they didn't have sprinting at the time. Well, I mean, technically, you're always sprinting. That was the canon explanation for it. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people really, really like Halo 2, but if you go back and play it, it's fucking rough, man. Like, it, it did not age as well as, like, Halo 3 has, or even Halo 4, which really wasn't liked at the time, has aged actually incredibly well. So I feel like a lot of the time it's people's, you know, rose-tinted glasses on, like, why a certain game is their favorite, but that, that's kind of like a little aside. It's not really specific to this game. This game, I can understand why a lot of people wouldn't like it, though. Just, like, the fact that it's all, like, heavily micro-based and almost plays more like a dungeon crawler in some ways than a, you know, it's, it's kind of like a dungeon crawler RPG more than, like, an RTS. RTS genre which complemented them, as well as appealing to a fringe of RTS fans. But I'm also glad that Dawn of War 2 exists. It shows how Dawn of War's gameplay concept could work in a different genre. I like its storyline and continuity with the last game, and it showed the kind of talent Relic had to make all sorts of different games. They're almost like separate series, with their expansions being like sequels, which makes me wonder if this game would have been better received had it been a spin-off, or a new series, rather than a full-on sequel. Oh, Still, probably. I don't think it would hurt to give Dawn of War 2 a whirl. I found the campaign to be good fun with only a slow start and repetition holding it down, and Skirmish is alright if you can grab some friends to play for a while, so long as you play Victory Point. Regardless, I think this game was dying for an expansion, even at launch, and the game was finally blessed by the malevolent touch of the ruinous powers a year later. So perhaps you'd be interested in taking a look at the next chapter with me, with Dawn of War 2, Chaos Rising. Okay. So, yeah, that game, it definitely seems interesting. It's, it's kind of a weird concept, though, what he was saying about, like, having no base building. And, uh, you know, obviously that makes, you know, since you're not going to be able to replace your units, you have to be far more strategic. You can't, you know, basically Zerg rush the enemy, which is a pretty common strategy especially when you're playing campaign mode because campaigns in most rts games are usually really super easy just build up a massive fleet that they can't compete with and just send it uh especially on like you know normal difficulty easy difficulty you know a lot in a lot of games even hard unless you're playing like whatever their their hardest one is which would be like veteran or impossible or uh you know whatever that's they decide to call it in that game usually then they'll actually have to you know put some thought into it but uh this kind of forces you to be more strategic, but it, it, it very much looks like it plays more like a RPG, like, dungeon crawler, with, like, the, the fact that you have, like, all this loot for your characters, and you have, from the looks of it, like, some kind of skill points, and you, you have a set limited amount of units. Now, now, in a lot of other RTS games, they do have levels like this, but they're, they're just individual levels. Like, in StarCraft, for example, there are certain levels where you're playing as, like, Raynor, and you just have Rainer and a handful of Marines and maybe, like, one or two, uh, I think they're called Vultures, the bikes in that game. Um, but it's usually only a level, maybe two. Uh, and then you get back to your normal base-building shenanigans. So that's definitely interesting. It's interesting that they decided to make the entire sequel like that. And I'm pretty sure there's Dawn of War 3 as well, isn't there? I, I think I remember reacting to the trailer for that. I'm going to Google that real quick. Um, I'm like 90% sure we reacted. <clears throat> yeah, there is. Dawn of War 3. It actually came out relatively recently, only five years ago. Um, so did Dawn of War 3 go back to the base building, or was Dawn of War 3 more of this kind of like dungeon crawler RTS, RPG type stuff? But anyway, the, the definitely, I like the video. I like his the, the way he inserts memes. I think he's he's got that nailed down. Uh, but anyway, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.